I do want to mention first, uh, see the elements of communion are here before me and we will be uh, having our our monthly communion service at the end of, of this service this morning. And, and just know that we you know, practice an open communion. You don't have to be a member of this church to partake in communion with us, but only that you are trusting in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. You're, you're a baptized believer, then you are welcome at our, at our table. Um, and I always want to encourage folks to just be preparing your heart through the course of, uh, of this service. If there's anything that, that you have that you feel like's between you and, and the Lord, um, you're only a, a prayer of, of confession away. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So um, let's just come at the end of this service with prepared hearts to, to the Lord's table. Now, where we're going to be this morning, you know, last week, you know, we talked about humility and that being a key in the kingdom. There are several things, and I'm not sure, you know, this probably won't go as long as the gospel of God theme went, but we're just going to be looking at different key principles of the kingdom of God that are vital for us to understand, to live in the light of, because they are so critical to living a, a victorious life in Christ. And, and this morning, we're going to be going to one of my absolute favorite passages of scripture. It's in 1 John chapter 3. I'm going to look at just the first three verses there. But there's a principle contained here and in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it's, it's mirrored there in, in different wording, but the, the sentiment is, is identical. We're going to be looking at both of these, but the principle that we're going to be focusing on this morning is you become what you behold. In other words, what you fashion your attention to, you will be like that. I mean, when I was growing up, uh, would to God I'd have paid more attention to my parents when I was growing up, but um, they would always encourage me or uh, discourage me in some of my friend selection because they would always tell me that I was going to end up like them, that if you hang around them, you'll be like them. And that was always a, a concern. And, and the idea is the same, because if you spend a lot of time with someone, you'll begin to pick up their, their habits. Now, that can be a very good thing if you're around good people. But ultimately, we as believers have this uh, mandate, and that's maybe not even the right scratch mandate, this destiny of becoming Christ-like. I mean, that, that is God's work in us, and God never fails. So let's look at these three verses, and then we'll, we'll dive in. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, we are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. There's one thing out, out of all of this, it, it talks very pointedly at those things which we will know and can know, but it says there's one thing that we do not know, and that is what we shall be. There is a, a very real sense that there is a mystery to the end of this journey that God has called believers into. Um, I, I've been walking with the Lord for over 30 years, and still to this day, 
I get I get surprised to the point of shock sometimes by who God is, who, who he reveals himself to be to me in ways previously unseen. Now you would think in 30 years that would be, you would pretty much have exhausted all the different ways that you could see God show up in your life and, and, and how he acts and how he feels towards you and, and what he, the knowledge that he brings you into. But then years ago, that, that all got wrecked in a little verse in First John, and not in First John, but in John's gospel, chapter 17, verse three, where it says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. So in that verse, suddenly this reality floods in that, that God's an infinite being. That means there's no exhausting the knowledge of who he is and the purpose that he is giving us as believers eternal life is so that we can know him, that we can continue to accumulate the knowledge of him to live in an ever increasing knowledge of who he is and to, to mirror his character, to be becoming like him. Because that's what's being laid out here in, in this verse and in the verse we're going to read here in a moment. It's being all laid out before us that, that God the good work that he has begun in us, he is going to complete. And that good work was laid out in Romans where he says that we, those he called, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So those that he called into himself, those that he acted graciously towards in giving them new life in Christ, he, he supplied them the word and the illumination of the Holy Spirit so that they could believe. And in believing they would have life through his name, those people he has predestined, he had prescribed a place for them to end up in the end. That's what predestined means. It means having a destiny that was predetermined. And for every single believer, the very same destiny is prescribed to them, is predetermined for them, and it is to be conformed to the image of his son. We had some discussion at the river last night. So some folks were going through a, a rather trying time. And one of the things that was brought up to them is this idea of being conformed to his image. And how that, if you're going to conform, I mean, some of our grandkids are still of the age that they enjoy playing with Play-Doh and, and, and Play-Doh always comes with all these little molds. And, and how do you get Play-Doh to take the form of the mold? It's pressure. I can remember even as a kid just taking a ball of Play-Doh and mashing it in my mm. fist. And you can see your fingerprints in it. You can see all the lines of your palm in it. It conformed to the image of my closed hand. Being conformed to the image of his son means Jesus is the prototype. Jesus is the mold that every single one of us will be cast to. We will be conformed to that image. And, and honestly, it's exactly what we want. If we've received new life in Christ, our desires have changed that, that we don't want what our flesh wants primarily. We still deal with the flesh and all the desires that goes along with that. But our ultimate desire, the desire that comes from the inside out, is for holiness. It is for Christ-likeness. And this, it says, it does not appear what we shall be. We don't know yet. If we did, we'd already be there. So I take from that the point that every one of us, what we lack right now from wherever we're at. I mean, I'm, I'm 30 years into this journey, but I know I have an unimaginable conforming yet to do to be to the image of Christ. I know I'm more Christ-like than I was 30 years ago, but I also know 
some level of how far I am from that. But ultimately, I also realize that I don't know him like I will. I know more of him than I did years ago, but I don't know him like I will. Like I will when I set aside this flesh that I've lived through all these years and I find myself not hindered by any fleshly desire that opposes the knowledge of God. I won't be questioning his goodness. Uh, there, there won't be any of the things that are obstacles to me living in fullness now. Those won't exist then. So it'll be a quantum leap forward in the knowledge of him. But I, I just do want to lay out before us, this is an, an eternal pursuit that we're going to be engaged in. Because this, this doesn't end because God doesn't end. So there is a destiny, and the destiny is a person, and his name's Jesus. So as we get closer, I, I know when we're, we're headed west to, to St. Louis, you begin to see one of the first things you see that's recognizable that you know you're getting close to St. Louis is the arch. But is St. Louis the arch? No. The arch is in St. Louis. You get a little closer, you see the ballpark. You know you're in, in St. Louis because you're seeing the ballpark. You're driving back past the ballpark. But is the ballpark St. Louis? No. What, what my point is here is what you know about Jesus, that that's all part of Jesus. What you know about God the Father is all part of God the Father. And to the degree that you know those truths, that they are truth, you have a true picture, but it's not complete. It is being completed. And your completion, your being brought into that place where you're living a life that is fully conformed to his image is dependent upon you seeing him as he is. And honestly, that is the only thing that stands between you and absolute perfection. It's the only thing that stands between you and the reaching of that destiny that you have in God. So this should be one of the primary pursuits of the human life is this pursuing the knowledge of God to go hard after God so that we can know him so as to be like him. We can know him so as to follow him. We, we can do life with him. This is where he's taken us, even though we don't know what that destiny looks like fully we can see enough of it in this life to see the direction that we're being taken. Some of the things that we know that come out of the early verses here. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us. The love of God. The love of God is beyond human description but the best that God has provided us and the best that his word points us towards is this greater love has no man than he would give his life for his friends when God did not withhold his own son but his son who, who was who was a part in God, God himself came in the person of Jesus Christ and suffered and died in our place. That proves the love of God beyond any shadow of doubt. You, you may have a, a thousand questions arise out of certain circumstances in your life. That is the answer to all of them. How could God let me go through? How could God let my loved one go through? You fill in the blank. Does God really love us if he lets us endure some level of suffering? Does he love us? While this world 
and in our interactions within it can cause thousands of objections to that to raise up in our flesh. The answer to them all is he came and he died. He came for, he came to us, he came for us. And not only us in our rebellion, us in our self All I can think of is, is, is big words here. And, and I got to say it clearly. Um, our inability to trust him as Lord and our absolute insistence upon being our own Lord. In other words, in living in open rebellion against God. God so loved us that he gave his son. God so loved us that he came, condescended to be one of us. Uh, uh, God the son who had been in everywhere at all times confined himself to human flesh, confined himself to be a man, the God man nonetheless, but a man from that point forward. That was a huge sacrifice, but then to go and endure death, even death on a cross for rebellious mankind, that is love. And that is love that is should be unquestionable. It, it should be in our view, no matter what objections, because I, I've seen God answer no to me in prayer at very critical times. And it was always the knowledge that he didn't withhold his own son and that his son, the very son of God, came and, and gave himself for me. That right there would pull me out of the pit. When, when, when you're praying over a 12-year-old boy that, that you're just certain God is going to restore, he's on life support, but you just know that, that God is fully able to do that, and you know, and I know full well today, he was fully able to do that. And then three days later, bury that young man. You have questions. There's lots of why questions. I still have why questions. I'm not sure God's going to answer my why questions when I get to heaven. I'm not sure I'll even ask him when I get to heaven. But I right now have why questions, but not if. Not, not if, not, not if God loves me because I know beyond any shadow of doubt, God has loved me because he went to the cross for me. And anything else that I look at that, that's a side issue to that, and, and I see that, that the pain came into my life and the life of loved ones, whenever stuff like that happens, that can be brought under the Lordship of Jesus Christ by just recognizing what he did do. Because you look at the vast majority of things that people accuse God over, it's things he didn't do. What does God allow? What does, and, and you've heard me talk enough about this to know, you know the, the answer to that question really belongs, um, it really has to be answered in another, in the other direction. You know, why? Why does man allow a lot of the things that, that God gets blamed for? You know, the evil in the world, the evil in the world doesn't have its source in God, it's, it's in man. And yeah, that's a rabbit hole, I'm not going any further down because that's a, mm. that, that one doesn't have an end, I fear. What level of love, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God? I talked a little bit already about you know, the rebellion. And rebellion, I mean, sure, in its ultimate manifestations, you get Hitler's and Pol Pot's and Mussolini's and Stalin's and, and, and that sort of ilk. That, that is the basement of human rebellion. But all humanity has the level of rebellion of self-rule. 
And that's the, the simple word I was looking for earlier that I couldn't find. It was this self-rule. I'm going to rule. I'm going to be the master of my own destiny. I'm going to call my own shots. I'm going to do what I want to do. And nobody's going to tell me. Once you've experienced the love of God. And you see that he is willing to take rebellious humans. Give them his life. And then a seat at his table to be welcomed into his family. To be adopted as children into his family to be in a, put in a place of, of great responsibility and authority as far as that goes. Authority beyond what we could ever dream of in our rebellious state. God confers that on to us when we realize there's only one being in the universe that loves us enough and has enough wisdom to guide our life. All humanity... Christian and non-Christian, all humanity leads their life according to self-interest. I believe it's the way God created us. Self-interest does not mean selfishness. Self-interest, redeemed self-interest sees that God's way is blessed and his blessings last for eternity and I would be crazy to go any other direction because he's the only one that loves me enough. He's the only one that's wise enough to chart me a path from where I am to a destiny that's so good I can't know it yet. It doesn't yet appear what we shall be, but we know that God has something planned for his people. The eye is not seen, ear is not served, neither has entered into the heart of man those things that God has prepared for those that love him. We, we see that straight out of scripture and it's borne out through all of, of the, the history that's contained in scripture and it's borne out in our experience if we're following him. We see that reality being borne out in, in all manner of circumstances. The fact that he has included us in his family is, it's familiar doctrinally. I mean, it's been taught. I mean, I, I've known that. I grew up in church. So, I mean, I, I knew that believers were part of the family of God. I mean, we sang that old song about the family of God. We, all of that, it was, so the, the familiarity with that concept sometimes, maybe all the time, creates a situation in our understanding where we are no longer aware of the scandal of that. It is absolutely scandalous that God would love us the way that he does. Us with our rebellion, us with our self-will and self-rule, us with hearts that were hardened against him, that he reached out through his love and suddenly, suddenly when we see the love of God for what it is, suddenly we see the wisdom that it's in our self-interest to go God's way and to draw as near to him as we possibly can. And ultimately, at that point, we want to be like him because there's no better goal for our life. And we have his power propelling us forward. He finishes the good work that he begins in us. And we, we are going to be like he is as we see him as he is. One other thing about being the children of God, it, it, it's now. In verse two, beloved, now we are the children of God. There is a, an element that is common, and I, I think it's probably a phase that most people, I don't know that it's universally necessary that everybody go through it, but that most people go through this stage of we were saved for pie in the sky when we die. 
We, we were saying everything that God is going to do will mystically happen in the moment that we pass through the door of death into our eternal glorified state. And in that moment, we will become, now not that there won't be a massive transaction and transformation take place there, there will for sure. But now we are the children of God. You're a child of God now. If you've come to faith in him, you're his child now. And you can speak to him, pray to him as a father now. We're not waiting for him to do. There, there is beyond all measure of the human imagination that available to us in this life. We, we limit our growth so much by just over inflating the power of our own flesh because we are very much acquainted with it. I mean, I, I know how much resistance there is to the will of God internally from my own flesh. I, I realize that. But if I focus upon that, if that what has my attention, I will be stunted. But when I realize that the only thing that stands between me and being who I can be and for sure will be in the end is me seeing him as he is. It's the reason. It's the reason this book is so essential to the Christian life is because God has given us his word. You've heard me recite this many times now through these years, but that Jesus is the word. He's the word made flesh. First John one, he's the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, a word is that which God, a word is that which any thinking being uses to communicate the, the desired thought to another. You have to use words. It can be words in print. It can be verbalized words. It can be sign language. And there's all manner, but a word contains meaning and it's moving the thoughts of one to another. It's an exchange of knowledge. It's an exchange of information. Jesus is the word. He is the ultimate communication of God about who he is. We want to see God. We want to know what God's like. We look at Jesus, the very word made flesh that dwelt among us. This is the word about the word. How do we know what Jesus did? His acts and his deeds are recorded in this word. How do we know how to interpret that? He sent his Holy Spirit to make it true to us, to, to bring the truths of it out to us. That brings about a theology. I have one, you have one, and it should be growing. Our theology is the truth about the truth. It, it's the word about the word about the word. But our understanding is what we receive. We're, that's on the receiving end. And as Jesus speaks who the Father is to us, as we see Jesus as he is, we are transformed. We are made like him through knowing who he is. I mentioned we was going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and it's verse 18. It says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory into glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. With unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror. Paul talks about it in another place, as in a mirror darkly. We, we, we see that the mirror of their day, I mean, mirror in our day is very accurate. But a mirror in their day would have been primarily a polished piece of metal, which would have been less than flat. There would have been a little bit of a funhouse effect to most mirrors that they had in that day. Or probably the best mirror they had was a basin of water in a lit room or out of doors. You could see your reflection in that. But if there was any movement, there would be ripples. And of course, that would distort the image. That's the idea here. We see him as clearly as we can. 
And we are transformed into the same image, but our sight isn't right. We see like the one who was being healed of blindness and got first partial healing. He says he saw men as trees walking. He could see, but it wasn't clear. Our flesh distorts our view. The world that we are immersed in here, it distorts our view. That There's all sorts of distortions that we get, but to the degree that we see him with clarity, we become like him. We are seeing more clearly all the time, and we are seeing more all the time, and we're being transformed into the same image from glory unto glory. As we see him revealed, and that's what glory means. Glory is not a, an abstract term that it doesn't have a definition. Glory is the brightness or the shining forth of God. It is the revelation of who God is. And we are transformed from glory into glory. However much like Jesus you are today, if you see him more, it may be the exact same things, but see him more, you'll be transformed more into his image. If you see more of him, in other words, if more information about him is realized by you on the heart level, you will be more like him. This is the ultimate destiny for mankind. This is what God desires for all when he says that it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance is but the surrender to the king who would gladly ask re or welcome rebe rebels to come out of the rebellion into his kingdom and to be part of his family and to be transformed into his image, to be like him. This, this is the invitation that we've been given. When he is revealed, back to verse, verse two of the first John passage, chapter three there, verse two, it says, but we know that when he is revealed, it's when. Right now he is being revealed. At his second coming, when we're called before him, he will be revealed. We, we will see him in an unhindered state. We, we will be in a totally, we will have sight beyond that which we can have any imagination to. He will be unveiled before us like never before. And we will have a, like I mentioned earlier, a quantum leap forward in who we are because we will see him more clearly than we've ever seen him. Though I don't believe we will have seen him completely even then, this, this will continue on throughout the ages eternally that we will be absolutely wowed by God. What, another one of my passages that my mind always goes to when I get on this theme is Isaiah 6 and the seraphim, the, the burning ones around the throne, the, those angelic beings which have eyes within and without who's who, who, are, who are seers. I mean, that, that's, what their, that's what their purpose is before the throne of God is to look upon his glory and they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole world, the whole earth is full of his glory. They, they just cry out. They cry out, holy, 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 and they're not bored. The, these are beings that have been for eons, I have no idea how time is measured there, nor do they, because they are captivated by the holiness of God, by viewing him in an unhindered way. They are so near the throne that they are called the burning ones, that they are just simply aflame with the glory of God. Yet it's similar to the flame that was in the burning bush. They are not consumed and they are not hurt. They are just so permeated with his glory that they cry out day and night, holy, holy, holy. The, they are not bored. The when he is revealed, it is a when, not if. When God is revealing himself now. He will reveal himself tomorrow and he will reveal himself ultimately 
when we cross into his very presence. And we will see him as he is. This is one of the greatest promises I feel like there is in all of scripture. When I look at this and I see with all the pursuing that I've done over these decades now, and I've grown significantly in my understanding and in my experience of him and, and the things that have penetrated my heart and I've been changed by, all of that is, is not insignificant. But I realize there is a long, long, long way to go. But I will see him as he is. It, it's a shall. It, it shall happen. It, it's fixed in the heart of God. He will do this. He will reveal himself through the person of his son. I will know him in an inexhaustible fashion, but I will know him. This is established in the heart of God and is as sure as his word. So in verse three, the response. All of this up to this point has just been the, the impetus, the, the, the force coming at us that, that is moving upon us. Verse three says, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Uh, there's some mystery and, and controversy, I guess, in, in this as well. Um, I, I read this again, you know, this week in at least eight different translations. About 50-50, you could just do a coin toss on the translators of this verse, how many of them capitalize him and how many leave it smaller case. Yeah, everyone who has this hope in him, him's capitalized there on the one in the screen, New King James version of, of scripture there. King James it is. Um, ESV doesn't. I don't remember which old ones did and which ones didn't, but it was basically 50-50. Uh, I fall into this category. My hope is in him. It's not just this hope that I have in me. There is a sense that that hope is within me. So I don't know that it's a violation of truth either way. But what I'm saying is the hope that we have in us is in him. My, my, my hope is not in my diligence to seek after him in my, um, my ability to pursue him, even my desire to pursue him. None of those things is where my hope, my hope is in him. And the hope in him is in me, but my hope resides in him. I have no hope. I have no hope of being like him. I have no hope of acceptance into his presence. I have no hope of not being rejected and, and cast to hell apart from the person of Jesus Christ. He is my hope. He is the source of all hope. And without him, there is no hope. So, but the one who has this hope, and, and it's not the hope of a home in heaven, and it's not the hope of escaping hell, the hope that's being spoken of here is the hope of Christ likeness. The one who has seen him with sufficient clarity to desire to be like him, whose heart has been transformed and has been uh, worked upon by God himself in such a, a transforming way that the new desires that were produced there is after Christ likeness. This is his definition of our destiny. Our destination is Christ likeness and he will accomplish it. And if you have the hope of Christ likeness in you, there are some things that you will be being engaged in and you can, you can judge in reality how much of this hope you have by how much of what it produces is evident in your life. 
Let's look at the rest of the verse. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And he is capitalized in all translations. But here, what we're looking at here in this verse is the very real principle that if you have the hope of Christ likeness, you will be engaged in purification of life. You will reckon yourself dead. You will mortify the deeds, kill off the deeds of the flesh and embrace obedience towards God. This is a reality. If you have the hope of Christ's likeness, you will be engaged in seeing that blossom in your life. If you have that hope, then you are a fellow laborer with God in this. You won't have the desire Without the working of the Holy Spirit, you won't have the power to accomplish it. You, in other words, you can't do this stuff without God. But God is not going to do it without you. So recognize, if you've identified with everything up to this point in this message this morning, and you think, yeah, I, I get that. God loves me. I get that. God is, is perfect and holy. And as I see him more clearly, I'm being transformed to be like him. I can, but if, if that's your hope, then you're going to be engaged in that which produces that outcome. You're going to be searching for him in scripture. You're going to be seeking him in the place of prayer. You're going to be, you're going to be pursuing him and to be like him, you're going to have that going on in an ongoing way and it's going to be an intense pursuit. So as we take a moment for some reflection on our own lives and where we land in all of this, how much of that, how much of that is alive and well on the inside of us? I mean, I can remember for the longest time, I gave almost no thought to Christ's likeness. I didn't have much in the way of uh, an awareness that that was even a goal early in my Christian walk. I mean, for me, two things. I wasn't even all that uh, fired up about getting to heaven, just not going to hell. That was the that, that was job one. Don't go to hell. Then okay, heaven's going to be a really awesome place. And then the word of God began to come open like like layers on, a, on an onion or something like that. I, I just got to see more and more and, and kept seeing closer and closer to the heart of the thing. And then it breaks through. And these were the verses. These were the verses along with a couple others that I already quoted. These, this was where my whole life was turned on its head. It, it was... And it didn't happen, you know, in just a, a blink. It wasn't like flipping a light switch. But that season of growth so transformed my life, it was similar to being born again again. I mean, as far as life change, it was as radical a change to shift from heaven and hell driven pursuit as to seeking him to know him as he is to, to know him in truth and then to allow because it's really not me at all that, that is in that uh, exchange it is God revealing himself and me being changed by that um, if that's where you're at this morning I would say you come on in, the water is fine. It's an amazing place to be. I can't imagine now going back to the place where I was before that transformation in my understanding. It's why I beat this like a drum. I've not preached 
directly from this passage all that often that I can find reference to, but, but I almost, I, I feel like I've not beat this into the ground, but I beat it like a drum over the years because this is so critical to the outcome of our life that I, I just feel like it's indispensable as one of the keys to kingdom life. It, it's a key that will unlock on the outside of that door, when you unlock that door and you step through the door to pursue Christ likeness, like you've never done it before, that it just opens a whole new world in Christ to those that have yet to see it. And for those of us that have, we don't have to worry if the door locked behind us because we would never try the handle. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure that there is a handle because you just don't look back. Th these things once seen cannot be unseen and you wouldn't want to. So this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna come to the Lord's table in, in just a, a few moments, but I just really wanna provide all of us with an opportunity to just, uh, to just embrace what we've heard this morning and to uh, give heart to it. God, I just thank you again for your word, Lord, and I thank you the way that it comes alive and, and is powerful, Lord, to, to affect us on the heart level, to change us as you desire to change us, Lord. We just pray for every condition of heart, Lord, that's represented here, God. Only you, only you know, Lord, for for any that, that would need salvation, God. We just pray, Lord, that you would cause faith to come alive, Lord, that they could trust you so just to, to surrender to you, Lord. And and God, for those that that have received you, but this morning are being called to walk in this hope. This, this hope of, of seeing you as you are and being transformed day by day, Lord. I always pray, Lord, that you would set that as an open door before all that are, are, are looking at it, God. And for those who have stepped through that door and some of them many years ago, Lord, I just pray that you would be the encourager, Lord, to, to push through, Lord, to, to continue to, to dive deep, Lord, and and search for the knowledge of you like, like hidden treasure, Lord. We just pray, God, for a, a hunger and thirst to arise beyond anything we've known before, Lord. I ask you that for myself as well, Lord, that you will just um, pour fuel on the fire uh, of the passionate pursuit, Lord, that you've ignited in my own life and the lives of others here, Lord. Now, God, I just commit each one to you, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for the privilege that it is to, to speak your truth to people, Lord. And now I, I just commit it to you, Lord, to see that it, it bears much fruit. God, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.